Hello, my name is Gavin Cooper and this is a pre-recorded presentation for the 2021 meeting of the Australasian Mathematical Psychology Conference. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that I've been doing with discrete choice experiments, which are just uh, an experiment where we present a number of different options on the screen and each of those options varies in a number of different attributes. Now these kind of discrete choice experiments have been used in a lot of different contexts. This is just one example from clinical psychology, a systematic review of DCEs to develop and deliver patient-centered psychological interventions. But they're also used in things like transport economics, um, climate change economics, a whole range of different kind of scenarios. But if you think about their format, then we also see them quite regularly as consumers when we're looking at comparing different products uh, via a number of different services, in this case booking.com, where we're comparing these hotels based off the price, the rating, uh, other kind of attributes of the hotel rooms and so on. Now the aspect of these experiments that I'm most interested in is not what level of each attribute goes into forming the final decision, but rather the strategies that people employ when they're performing these kind of tasks. So over the last 50 years, there have been a, quite a number of different strategies that have been proposed in the literature, but discriminating between them in individuals' data is often quite difficult. Now my approach to solving this issue has been to categorise each of the different uh, strategies based off some of their assumptions of the processing that underlies that particular uh, strategy. So some strategies assume a very serial processing of the attributes, one attribute after the other. Others assume that attributes are processed in parallel at the same time. Some assume that the information is integrated early into a, a utility per option, which is then assessed between options. And then other assumptions may be whether all the information needs to be processed before the uh, final choice, an exhaustive processing of options and alternatives. Others, uh, which are known as like self-terminating, are where the alternatives, the attributes, don't all need to be processed before the final choice. So now we can move on to some experiments. Now, the original design for working with this kind of DCE was a stripped back version where we just had a price and a rating for each option. And the levels of the price and rating were kind of schem schematically um, displayed here. So a specific criteria was given to the participant, a low salience uh, stimulus was sampled from this range here, which was just a little bit less than the criteria. A high salience price was sampled from this distribution, which was a lot less than the criteria. So this should have been an easier choice in terms of the, the salience level of the price. And then there was also distractor uh, stimuli that had a distractor in either the price, which was a little bit above the price, a bit above the price, or a distractor in rating, which was a bit below the rating. So they should accept a hotel if the price came from the high or low salience and the rating came from the high or low salience. So this is what they were uh, given. So just the numbers here, the price and the rating, these are just for the presentation. And if it was if they're if they're both high or low, then they should accept. If one or the other is a distractor or both distractor, then they should reject. Now there is a problem with both this experiment and a follow-up that had a different kind of method of presenting the attribute information that was otherwise pretty much the same, was that these experiments are veridical. We're giving the, uh, the participant a specific criteria to implement rather than letting them exhibit their own preferences. So the solution to this is to create a new version of this experiment where we determine each individual participant's threshold at the start of the task and then set those high, low and distractor salience levels based off the individual's threshold. 
So there's two ways. This, this determining of the threshold, I've gone about it in two different ways. One, I've called it an implicit method, where we present uh, some hotels on the screen, uh, giving them a rating and a price, and they either accept or reject the hotel based off their own preferences. And as they reject, the price generally gets lower, and as they accept, the price gets higher, until they're at a point where they feel that the uh, trade-off, the extra benefit of getting a higher rating isn't worth the extra money that they're spending. And then they tend to hover around that value using a staircase method uh, kind of imported wholesale from psychophysics. And this generally hovers around a certain value and the main of the kind of staircase steps from the last few steps is, is used to determine the user's threshold. The other method of determining the threshold for the other group is what I called an explicit method where I gave the participants, again, a display showing the rating and the price of a particular hotel, and a slider that they could control that would change these values, and they could control where on the slider they thought uh, the optimal trade-off between a good rating but still an acceptable price would be. And now a quick look at some data. So I finished acquisition of the data towards the end of last year. So these are initial kind of views of the data uh, with a look of doing some more modeling uh, based on some models I've done of the vertical choice data. Apply that into this preferential choice data set um, in the future. But some initial kind of views of the data we've got. So the thresholds that we've determined in each of the two conditions, there was a significant difference between the thresholds in the implicit condition with higher kind of a higher mean threshold for their price compared to the rating. Uh, however, the variability uh, is non-significant. There's no significant differences in the variability between the implicit and explicit conditions. The time to find the threshold, so the length of time it takes from the start of the process of finding the threshold through to the end uh, didn't vary between the two groups. And this is somewhat surprising. So the explicit group were given two trials of sliders where they played around with the slider until they were comfortable with the position. The implicit group had this staircase procedure with many trials in comparison. So usually 20, 30, maybe 40 trials before they came up with a final uh, kind of threshold using this staircase procedure. But when we look at the trials in total, like combine all the um, implicit trials, combine the two explicit trials, the length of time overall is roughly the same between the two groups. So this kind of implies to me that people in the explicit group we're taking their time with the, with the sliders to come up with this, um, this nice threshold. Once we had the threshold, one of the initial things that I've done is have a look at how consistent their choices in the latter part of the experiment, where we're just giving these, kind of price, uh, these options with a price and quality based off the high, low and distractor salience levels built from their um, threshold developed in the start of the task. We're looking at how consistent their choices in the latter half are with the threshold. So if we think they should be responding accept, this means that both the price and the quality were either high or low salience. So these first four sets here, uh, they're consistent if they're accepting when we think they should be accepting. And they're consistent in, this, in these last five when they're rejecting, because we think they should be rejecting if either price or quality is below their threshold that we've determined. And that's generally the case. So they're consistent in these accept trials uh, at least 75% of the time um, for the double high salience upwards of 90% of the time. For the reject, certainly for reject on the double distractor, so where both price and quality are bad, they're consistent with that threshold quite a lot of the time. Uh, and when the distractor is in the price attribute, they're again rejecting 
75, 60% of the time. However, if the distractor is in the quality kind of attribute alone, then they're nowhere near as consistent with those thresholds. And I think this is probably related to the fact that the range that the price varied over was quite large, 250 to 450 kind of dollars, but the range that the quality ranged over was nowhere near as large. It was like uh, 6.57 through to like 9.5. And part of that restricted range was because we uh, came up with these values based on a survey of actual hotel prices and quality ratings in the Sydney CBD. So something to do with that restricted range of the quality, plus also some kind of bias towards uh, like price attributes being more um, important to people probably leads to this lower consistency in these last two bars here. As I said, there's still modelling to be done in terms of the architectures being employed and therefore the strategies being run on these tasks, but that's the, my new and exciting data. Thank you very much.